Hello and welcome to the Flash Memory Summit virtually this year. Um, today we're going to talk to you about flexible computational storage solutions. Uh, and I'm here, I'm, I'm Neil Wordmuller. I'm the Director of Storage Solutions with ARM uh, and I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. Hello everyone. Uh, hello, my name is Jason Mulgard and I'm a Storage Solutions Architect with ARM and I work very closely with Neil on uh, computational storage and other storage related architectures. It's nice to meet you. Great. Well, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, very brief view of the agenda. So I think really to introduce this, we need to get, get into sort of what's driving computational storage. Um, then we need to look at some of the different controller architecture options. Um, and then I think we can delve into really what's driving Linux and also what are the key workloads for computational storage and, and how that plays along with Linux. Uh, and then we'll touch on the conclusions. So diving straight in. So yeah, what's driving? So here, um, basically the overview of really computational storage is all about generating insight really where the data is stored. So that's on the storage drive itself. So in the traditional model on the left here, then we, ha we have basically compute. So that's probably servers, um, a host of some description. And typically what that will do is make a request to the storage. The storage will go off and retrieve it from the NAND or the hard disk drive platters, move it into the, the memory, wrap it up in protocol. So um, NVMe, PCIe, and shift it back to the compute. Only now can that compute actually start processing it. And once it's done that, perhaps it's going to move results back to the storage. But obviously, there's quite a bit of time while the st server here is waiting for that data to be retrieved and then moved across whatever fabric it may be. And this may be directly attached over PCIe. It may be going over the Ethernet for, um, and Internet um, from a very long distance. So in the computational storage case, we have these, these servers, the host that wants to do this, um, and that can make an operation, but then the compute can happen directly on the data that's stored. So it's, it's moved from NAND or from the disk platter into the DRAM on the device, now it can be computed. Um, and then you can perhaps return results if that's being driven. And we basically see two main variants of this, um, one of which we term autonomous computational storage. And this is potentially where really the drive is just managing itself. It has workloads installed on it. And perhaps it's um, basically as soon as data is stored on the drive, it's picking up that data and doing some form of processing on it. An example might be that if this host happens to be a, a medical scanner, it's storing images to a drive Great, but this drive itself can be doing machine learning on those images in the background, maybe doing detection for cancer in all of those images. Um, and then if actually it can return results to the server, but it's, it's not moving huge images around in this system, it can do that compute directly here. Um, the other topic, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about later, but is about host managed computational storage. And this is more where we see micro operations being sent to the drive and it performs some functions. And so maybe it's searching for a particular item in a database on the drive and it'll return the result. But often there's a lot more communication in this system in this kind of host management uh, system. But really what this all boils down to is it's gonna be very much more energy efficient than moving data backwards and forwards. So much of this data these days are images and video um, stored on the internet and in the data centers. Those are huge and it requires energy to move them. It also takes length, it takes time to move those images from the storage to the compute. If you can just move it from the NAND uh, with really high bandwidth inside these controller devices, so from the NAND to the DRAM and process, much, much faster. And again, if you're moving this data, you get better security. Um, Obviously this opens up, if you've got um, some areas, this could open up bigger security issues and we'll talk about that later. Obviously security is very, very important, but it's all about data centric workloads. So really, I think in order for computational storage to take off, we all accept there needs to be a good standard behind it. And SNEER with the computational storage technical working group is, is driving this forward very rapidly. Um, there is a draft standard available today, but it's really about enabling um, big customers to be able to multi-source drives that can be interoperable um, from, from different vendors. Um, and again, here with this diagram, there are two particular ways, places really where the compute can happen. So, so here you can have compute 
um, that's separate from the drive, but maybe over multiple drives. But you can also have the compute in the drive itself. So obviously already drives have a fair amount of compute in them. But if you add some computational storage here, this becomes very, very scalable. The more drives you add, the more compute you add. Um, so again, we think that's a, a, an interesting solution. Obviously, I think there are many ways of adding compute on the drive. You could use FPGAs. I think a lot of early proof of concepts and products um, have been using FPGAs, but those are a challenge to program and, and to update. Um, they're also a challenge in terms of power and cost, but they can also have very high performance. So FPGA is certainly a solution here, but we're certainly seeing a move more towards ASIC solutions. So in a custom compute uh, that, that's able to, to move that forward. Obviously, a lot of companies involved um, in this technical working group through SNEA. Um, huge number of people individually contributing, um, but it's a great team effort from all of these different companies to make this a reality. So really, what, what is the technical working group doing? It's looking to define NVMe extensions that enable computational storage services. So to enable discovery of drives that got computational storage, to configure them, and, and actually use the compute that's on those drives. Um, and obviously, the simple way that's going to happen is that this is a simple diagram of an existing um, SSD. So you've got a PCIe interface, you've got NVMe commands coming over that PCIe. Today they're handled by the front end processor and it manages retrieving or writing data to and from the NAND um, and moving it to the DRAM. So um, the next idea that we see is very interesting is obviously we're seeing a big movement towards NVMe over fabric and certainly TCP IP is a Ethernet is a really simple example of this that I think we can all understand. So here, basically, all it is is these NVMe commands are now, instead of coming over PCIe, they're being carried in Ethernet packets and they arrive at these drives. But again, it'll be the same extensions to NVMe that are going to be delivered uh, and can be processed. So what we think is very exciting, um, really, and, and solves a lot of the challenges that I think are brought up by these the systems, is where we now add Linux to this solution. So we've now got this Ethernet interface and we've got our standard um, NVMe over fabric packets arriving. So if it's an NVMe over fabric, it can either be processed if it's a standard NVMe packet um, processed by this. If it's computational storage packet in NVMe, it can be processed by this Linux. And there's another advantage here that actually, because you've got a TCP IP link to this computational storage drive, you can basically, it basically is a mini server. Anything that you would normally do over Ethernet to connect to a server, you can do over here. You don't have to, but it's an interesting option that adds flexibility. And we believe time to market just to, to make this all happen very quickly. But the beauty of this is it all just connects up to any standard fabric in the, in the data center. You can run any standard Linux distribution here. You can run a very mini cut down version with just the things you want or a full blown version of Linux. The workloads can be deployed um, either using some of the standards that are being developed for, for the NVMe, but you could also yes, just use things like Docker running you know, with Kubernetes to download workloads directly as you would with any other server box in the system. A key feature here, and Jason will talk more about this in detail later, but Linux is able to understand the file system. A standard SSD just gets blocks of data to store and it breaks it into little pages, puts it into NAND in the, in the best possible places. And on, uh, on a read request, it'll get back those pages, assemble them in the DRAM and, the, and then send them back. But it doesn't know that those four blocks happen to make up a JPEG. If you've got Linux on the drive now, you can mount that file system and you understand what that data is. And now you can start doing this autonomous compute on that data. You know that this, it's an MPEG image, uh, MPEG video. You can now do some ML on that to look for anomalies or for look for alerts. So that's where we think this is a, a really big value. But again, it's really about just moving data from the RAM, or from the NAND to the RAM and then being able to process it. One thing that's very key here is the bandwidth in this system is much, much higher than over um, a PCIe interface or even over Ethernet typically. So you can get very high bandwidth in this system and that enables very high performance inside here. Um, 
as I say, you can manage it using any of the tools that you, you use with any other server. And of course, it adopts all the standard security systems that already have been existed. You don't need to reinvent any new wheels here. Um, they already exist and you can just adopt those. So again, eBPF, uh, the enhanced Barclay packet filters is a way of basically having a, a virtual machine that can run on the drive. Now this enables, in our view, more of the kind of host managed computational storage. So this is where you can download small little uh, sets of code it could be larger, but typically we're expecting them to be reasonably small, um, and then they can be invoked by the host. So we're expecting quite a lot of communication in this system, but again, it enables the host to really manage um, this computational storage drive, and it can do whatever compute it, um, it needs and is being asked to do by the host. Um, eBPF, though, is is based on on running on top of the Linux kernel, so it is we believe a, a simplest way to get this up and running is to have Linux on the drive, then it's all there and it just works, um, as well as building the other options on top. So again, this is a very simple way of making it happen. Um, and of course, uh, I think that's, it's a very interesting uh, approach. So now I was gonna hand over to Jason um, to talk about the next section. Great, thank you, Neil. So uh, let's take a look at the controller architecture options and how we would go about building a uh, computational storage drive. So first, taking a look at a, a traditional SSD, which is shown on this diagram over on the right-hand side, uh, there's already a lot of compute built into the, the SSD controllers of today. It's often broken up into a front end and a back end, uh, where the front end manages the host interface and the FTL, the flash translation layer, and the back end is the flash management. In the front end, the, uh, these are typically today Cortex-R and in some cases Cortex-A applications processors. And in the back end, these are typically uh, Cortex-R real-time and Cortex-M processors. There certainly is a, a lot of hardware accelerators in an SSD, encryption, LDPC, compression. There could be uh, ARM NEON, the uh, machine learning SIMD uh, instructions to accelerate machine learning type workloads could even be built on an FPGA. But one thing's for certain is all these SSD controllers require a significant amount of DRAM for storing the flash translation tables to the tune of one gigabyte per terabyte of NAND. So for a typical SSD that's 16, 32, or even 64 terabytes, that requires 16, 32, or 64 gigabytes of DRAM, certainly a significant amount of DRAM. And, and as Neil mentioned, a lot of drives today are based upon PCIe, um, some moving to PCIe, um, you know, NVMe over fabrics with, over TCP, and, but still a little bit of SATA and SAS out there as well. So one of the things Neil mentioned is the autonomous processing on the drive. So this compute that's already there today does a significant amount of uh, processing autonomously. In particular, the host sends LBAs to the drive, logical block addresses are then translated into physical addresses for where the data is actually stored in the media. And the, and the, the controller does all this mapping, it does all this translation autonomously. So as Neil mentioned, if we now have the ability to have Linux on the drive that can recognize file systems and mount the file system, the drive now is capable of record of knowing which LBAs comprise a file and then subsequently which physical addresses are contain the data for those LBA representations. And the drive can now perform any kind of operation on those files that the host was previously doing. This could include uh, processing either in place after the files have been stored or as the data is streaming in. But the bottom line is that any workload that was running on the host can now be run on the drive. Any processing that was done on the host can process on the drive. So what are the options to add uh, Linux to the drive? Well, if we <clears throat> take a look at these pictures over on the right-hand side, we've got our uh, uh, traditional SSD uh, in the top that's connected to uh, an interposer card or, or a daughter card. Uh, that has an applications processor. So it's using a traditional SSD, uh, connecting an interposer card to the front of it that with that applications processor, 
This is a great proof of concept to enable getting an applications processor for running Linux into uh, the, the drive data path, uh, but it has some challenges. So certainly the, the big one is that the, the back-to-back -back PCIe interfaces. So the, you, you still have to package up the user data uh, into uh, NVMe, PCIe, move it across that interface and unpackage it at the other side and then actually perform the compute in that applications processor. So we haven't saved much of the, the bandwidth or latency out of the drive. We've certainly saved it going to the host, but uh, we're still moving a significant amount of data. Of course, this applications processor requires its own non volta storage for the Linux and its own DRAM. So the next logical step is, well, let's bring that applications processor into the controller itself. And that's what's represented by the, the diagram in the middle. We've got the same essential SSD overall architecture, except we have now brought the, the applications processor in. We've eliminated the challenges uh, mentioned previously with the back-to-back -back PCIe interfaces. This applications processor is now able to share DRAM. It's able to use the non-volatile NAND storage for the uh, Linux uh, installation. And it just solves all those challenges, uh, making a more streamlined architecture. Well, the next logical progression then shown in the bottom diagram is maybe we can have the applications and front end processors combined. And this is especially true because as I mentioned in a previous slide, some folks are already using applications processor for managing their FTL in the front end of their SSD controller. So why not combine all these together into one uh, cluster of course? And this will provide a lot of benefits in terms of uh, uh, area savings, power reduction, and uh, new flexibility that we'll get into in, in just a couple of slides. But first I wanna mention, if you look over on the left-hand side of this slide, we've got an example of a fairly recent version of Debian 9 uh, Linux and, and what its system requirements are. So in, it needs a minimum of 128 megabytes and maybe it prefers 512 megabytes of DRAM and two gigabytes of uh, hard drive capacity for the installation. So if we think about that, uh, that DRAM, 512 megabytes, that's less than 5% of a 16 terabyte SSD that has 16 gigabytes of DRAM. So certainly not trivial, but not a, not a large amount either. Uh, it may be possible to just use that 16 gigabytes or potentially add just a small amount more to the drive. And, and certainly with 16 terabytes, using uh, two gigabytes for storage is kind of inconsequential compared to the overall capacity. So I'd like to introduce to you the Cortex-R82. This is a new processor from ARM. It is a real-time uh, CPU uh, with a, a very large address space. It's a 64-bit processor with a 40-bit physical address that enables uh, addressing large uh, address maps. And this is especially useful in storage devices where, as I just mentioned, 16 gigabytes of DRAM needs to be addressed along with all the other uh, peripherals and devices and accelerators in the system. And the, the Cortex R82 allows that to be done in a, with a flat address map. But it is still a classic real-time CPU from ARM with low latencies and consistent performance to achieve the best possible uh, IOPS and, and, and lowest latency performance through the drive. But this real-time processor also contains a memory management unit that is optional. Uh, and this enables running Linux on, the, on these cores as well. And it can be Linux in addition to real time or, um, or, or combinations based upon uh, whatever is required. And we'll get into a little bit more of that in the next few slides. But the Cortex R82 also enables coherency either between additional clusters of Cortex R82 or Cor Cortex R82 and clusters of Cortex A. So you can build up a more sophisticated system uh, with additional Cortex A cores. You can even have coherency between other clusters or even across CXL or C6. And the R82 contains the uh, Neon CIMD uh, instructions to accelerate machine learning workloads. And machine learning is a, a great use for uh, computational storage. So let's talk a little bit more about the flexibility that the Cortex R82 provides. So if we look at this classic enterprise drive diagram over on the left-hand side, the side of this slide, there's four cores that have been all allocated for real time. And this allows the drive to 
achieve the best possible IOPS, the best throughput, uh, lowest latency. Well, we can take that exact same controller and potentially repurpose it for a different product targeted at computational storage where we reallocated half of the cores in this example for running uh, Linux, running a rich operating system. No changes were needed to the controller. Just rebooted the, those Linux, those cores into Linux instead of uh, running the real time. And this enables the computational storage drive to be created without actually having another tape out. And that saves a lot of development cost, a lot of mask set cost, and uh, allows the product to be delivered very quickly. So we can extend this to having additional flexibility in the balance of the workload. So with that same controller now, it's possible to have the, the drive change its uh, characteristics as the workload changes. So maybe during the day, during busy times of the day, there's a, a tremendous amount of data that's being um, read from or written to the drive. And we need to allocate three or maybe all of the cores to running uh, real time in order to give the best possible performance. But then that same controller later on in the day, we can say, well, it's, the drive's not as busy. Let's move to having more of the cores dedicated towards computation. And now you can reboot those cores into Linux and begin doing compute on the, on the data that's been stored in that drive. So as Neil had mentioned earlier, essentially, if we step back and take a look at it, we have an edge server. So if we look at this diagram on the right-hand side, uh, the labeled classic edge server, essentially what we've drawn here is an edge server with an SSD connected to it. So the edge server has a CPU, a DRAM, PCIe, and network interface. And connected to that PCIe interface is a, a SSD with a PCIe interface, a CPU, DRAM, and flash. Well, because we can now run any workload on that, that drive, that computational storage drive, we essentially have the diagram on the left. It's an edge server with a CPU, DRAM, and flash. And we can substitute for the PCIe. We could put a network interface on it, as Neil had mentioned earlier, running TCP IP. Uh, and uh, NVMe over fabrics uh, for connecting and communicating to that drive uh, natively using uh, the ethernet protocol. And you can even power that drive potentially using power over ethernet. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Neil to discuss uh, Linux and the key workloads. Great, thank you, Jason. So yeah, this section, we're gonna talk about really what, what we believe is driving Linux and what are the key workloads that are, that are really pushing it forward. So I think one of the fundamental parts here is that basically if you have Linux on the drive, um, any of the workloads that, that, that run Linux can now move next to the data. They don't need to be recompiled. You can take advantage of that huge cloud native software ecosystem that's being developed. Um, that really speeds development, accelerates innovation. We're not reinventing anything here. We're just being able to move things directly onto the storage to take advantage of that benefit of not having to move those huge data sets around across a, a bigger fabric. Um, obviously, I think you know it pulls with it all of the standard tools, development systems that people are used to in developing Linux. That all exists. You can now use it, put that workload directly onto the drive. Um, all the different Linux distributions that, that run on ARM. There are, there are all, all of the major ones are there. There are a huge number of applications, databases, and other things as well. That all just comes. Um, and again, all of this huge ecosystem of Linux developers, they, they know these tools. Now they can actually do this development directly on the drive. So I think it's really going to see some innovation um, and some exciting new applications. Obviously, just to give you a very quick idea of the ecosystem here, but obviously we've got networking, we've got operating systems, all of the different container systems and virtualization, um, all the languages, the workloads, you know, it all just comes and now you can run it directly on the data. In terms of yeah, which, which workloads make sense to move next to the data, we, we see a, a great deal of interest for, for many, many of our partners. Obviously offload, doing some basically low level functions like compression, encryption, erasure, encoding directly on that data. 
some of those are very obvious. And instead of having to move that data up to a host, do compression, move it all the way back again and store it, it's just a huge waste of energy and, and bandwidth and it adds a lot of latency. Just compress it directly on the drive. Deduplicate it. There are many applications here that are, that are really interesting. Obviously, databases, again, I think those are a really good example where typically you're moving huge amounts of data around a system. Um, but actually, if you just want to do a search, why not just send a search to the drive where that data resides and return that data? Machine learning, again, machine learning is really about the data. Um, typically, the, the uh, neural networks boil down to quite a few Mac, multiply and accumulate um, instructions at the low level. And basically things like NEON in the ARM processors does a reasonable job of that. Obviously you could add neural processing units, you can add much more capabilities, but just having that basic level, when you are able to do it directly on that data where it resides, can be really beneficial. You don't necessarily need the huge performance because you can do it in the background. Um, potentially you can do it every time a file stored, you can do your categorization or um, those kind of things. But yeah, there, there's a lot of applications. And some of these others, content delivery network, doing offload from a smart NIC to an attached computational storage drive. It's kind of offload from the offload. Uh, we see that as really interesting. Um, obviously, Jason touched on edge computing, but this image video, um, clearly that's where we're seeing an awful lot of pull from, from uh, our partners and, and their customers. So there's some really exciting things happening. And transportation as well in, in, in uh, automotive, but also in avionics, people are looking at things like using ML to look at anomalies in, in telematic data and doing it as, as the data is being stored. So there are some very interesting things happening there as well. And custom workloads, obviously, these are just a few ideas. There are thousands, an infinite number of potential custom workloads that, that people can develop. Um, and the idea with the Linux is it, it can be the end customer, either the hyperscaler or the cloud company that can move their own application directly onto the drive, onto that data, um, with whichever Linux distribution they want, have complete control of that um, on the drive itself where the data resides. And that's what we see is really exciting. It really enables people to work on that data. So obviously, how do you get, get workloads and things onto the drive? Well, there's, you can use the, the computational standard storage, computational storage standardized protocols that are being developed um, via the SNEA technical working group that end up in the NVMe protocol standards. Um, and you use those over NVMe or NVMe, NVMe over fabric. But there's also the containerization that you can do, which because you've got a TCP IP link to the drive, um, you can then basically use any of the standard Kubernetes, Docker, Rancher, all of those good things to enable you to deploy whatever you want into that, into that Linux system. Um, Obviously, the enhanced Barclay packet filter is very interesting as well. And yes, it is possible to create uh, probably a stripped down version of this that can run on a bare bones, um, kind of cut down Linux system um, that, that allows you to run the eBPF um, virtual uh, uh, code that's been delivered. But that's pretty complex. If you just run Linux on the machine, that can just happen with, without needing any new secret source. It just makes it very easy to do. So there are many different variations here. And uh, obviously we're very keen on the standardization. Um, I think the middle box here is still standardized. It's just um, looking at it at a slightly different angle. And obviously once you've got that, then some of these other standard things like EPF or other systems that are available in Linux, you know, they all become available. So I was gonna hand back to Jason really for the conclusion. Thank you. All right, thank you, Neil. So uh, to kind of wrap things up today, so what we've kind of discussed is that uh, there are a, a large number of workloads and they're very diverse uh, for running on computational storage. Lots of different use cases and applications. And we think that they're best enabled through on-drive Linux. The Linux community has, there's a huge developer community, lots of applications have been ported and optimized to run well on Linux and an ARM. And it just enables everything to become available very quickly and easily and accelerate development the controllers themselves require flexibility and they need to be able to handle different um, products, different workloads without having different mask sets. We want to be able to tape out one controller and develop different products all in one. 
And we want to be able to dynamically change that based upon the, the workload over the course of the day. Having real time and Linux um, go back and forth as, as needed for uh, different workloads or different uh, levels of uh, uh, activity on the drive. And of course, in order to support these high performing drives and increasing data rates, we still need to have a real time core that's capable of um, providing that real time support and low latency fast access. So with that, thank you very much for joining us today and um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your virtual FMS. Thank you. Thank you.